Yoshi. What is going on everybody? It's me, Roku, back with some more Baldur's Gate 3 content. In this video, we're going to go through this Baldur's Gate 3 iceberg. Now, when I wanted to make this video, I was really hoping for there to be like an already made iceberg on Reddit or something, but <laughs> there wasn't. So I had to go through the whole thing and make it from ground up myself. If you have additional ideas as to what else should be included in the iceberg, let us know in the comments below. So yeah, let's get to it. Level 1. Tadpole. Sven Vinka is in the game. Sven Vinka is the CEO of Larian Studios, which is a company that created Baldur's Gate 3. Now, if you look up images of this guy on the internet, the most famous one you'll find is him wearing like a full suit of medieval knight armor. This absolute giga chat straight up just owns a full suit because why not, I guess? Now, when you open up the game and are taken to the main menu, you'll be in a ball temple underneath the Baldur's Gate city. After a while, a few adventures will enter, and the guy at the very front holding the torch is Sven Vinka himself. This is a cool little easter egg as our homeboy is just living his best life, <laughs> putting himself in the best game of all time, potentially. Shart. One of the companions that you meet pretty early on into the game is called Shadowheart. Now, we don't really like long words and things to say on the internet, so the collective shortened version of her name that the community has come up with is... <laughs> Shart. <laughs> there really isn't anything interesting here, I just thought it was funny. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, on to the next point. Minthara Companion. A lot of the newer players don't know this, but in the Goblin Camp, you will meet a drow as a part of the Kill the Three Goblin Leaders quest. Her name is Minthara, and she is a potential companion. To get her as a companion, you essentially have to help her wipe out the Druid Grove instead of killing the Goblin Leaders. After you do that, she will become a companion in Moonrise Towers within Act 2. Now this decision on its own is a little insane because not only do you have to wipe out an entire grove full of refugees who are just fleeing for their lives, but you also miss out on Will and Mama K as a companion, which is a huge, huge, huge loss. But if you're doing an evil playthrough, gotta do what you gotta do. The Cabbage Merchant. If you are within the Baldur's Gate city in Act 3, there's a guy called Geezer Loris. This guy is basically just writhing in anguish over his cabbages being spilt all over the ground. This is a pretty clear easter egg to Avatar The Last Airbender. Now the joke is, within Avatar The Last Airbender, the characters kind of move around the world a lot, and every time they're like in a city or like a marketplace, and they're in a fight, they'll either on purpose or accidentally destroy a stall or a container full of cabbages to be sold. The running joke is that all these cabbages are being sold by the same guy called the Cabbage Merchant, and Homie just can't catch a break regardless of where he is around the world. Will's death dad is Duke Ravenguard. This one comes up pretty early on into the story, but essentially speaking, Will's dad, Duke Ravenguard, is the leader of the Flaming Fist, and also one of the Council of Four, which is the primary ruling body of the Baldur's Gate city. Now this fact isn't much of a mystery as it's a core part of Will's character and his companion quest, but if you were doing an evil playthrough, you wouldn't get Will and you wouldn't really know this fact. Level 2, Special Tadpole. Speak with animals. This one really isn't one specific thing, but more so an entire dimension to the game that you can very easily miss. Every single animal in this game has their own full set of voice lines that you can access with a Speak With Animals spell. Now the animals have varying levels of intelligence, some are as dumb as you'd think they'd be, whereas others are smarter than like actual people in the real world, <laughs> but there are many cases where the animals will have things to say or do that will help you out in quests big time. So for your next run, I recommend that you have at least one one party member with a Speak With Animals ability. Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. This one might be an absolute shocker, but Baldur's Gate 3 is the third Baldur's Gate game. Whoa! <laughs> Now, having played the other games or not doesn't really reduce your enjoyment of Baldur's Gate 3. There are plenty of callbacks, easter eggs, and references to what happened from the previous games. Two of the playable companions in the game, Minsk and Jahira, are playable companions within the previous games as well. If you're interested in the lore of the D&D universe, I heavily recommend that you check out a lore summary video of the previous two games. If you would want me to make such a video, let me know in the comment section down below. Asterion is a vampire spy. On. This one is another companion factoid that you learn partway through Act 1. A big distinction to be made is that Asterion is a vampire spawn, not 
a vampire. Vampires within the world of D&D are very similar to the vampires that we know in our pop culture, whereas a vampire spawn is essentially a creature with all the weaknesses of a vampire, who has a very long eternal life, who's also completely controlled by their host vampire. Essentially speaking, a vampire can turn anyone into a vampire spawn, and then that spawn has to serve them for eternity. So within the game, Asterion is a vampire spawn for a vampire called Kazador, who you meet at some point in the game. Lazel kills you ending. This is a way that the game can prematurely end pretty early on. Now during the third or the fourth or just one of the initial nights, your characters will all feel a fever and just feel super sick due to the tadpole infection. Lazel, seeing this, will sneak up behind you and try to kill you. If you tell her to go ahead with it or if you fail a check I think, she will just straight up slit your throat and try to run at the other companions trying to kill them. If she succeeds, or if you have no other companions, then the game is over on the spot. Asterion gives you the Zuck. This one is another way where the game can end prematurely, where Asterion sneaks up on you to drink your blood at night while you're asleep. Your character will then wake up, giving you the option to fight him and kill him, say no, or actually allow him to go on and drink your blood, which unlocks his vampire powers earlier on. When he begins, you get two opportunities to stop him, but if you fail both, he does not stop drinking your blood, and essentially just keeps zucking until you're dead. Level 3. This brain thing with legs. <laughs> Gale explodes you. This one is similar to the other companion kills you endings, but instead of just killing you, Gale kills everyone, essentially. He kills everyone in the grove, possibly everyone in the goblin camp, and just straight up everyone around him. As we all know throughout the game, Gale has a bit of the weave trapped within him that can explode at any point in the game. Now once you meet Elminster, he does kind of put it on lock so that he can control it, but if you just straight up kill Gale the first time you meet him, his hologram will show up and tell you to revive him within three days. If you ignore this and just straight up go for three long rests, his body will essentially start floating and explode, killing everyone and resulting in a game over. The Dark Urge is a ball spawn. If you picked the Dark Urge origin when creating your character, you'll find out that your character is very predisposed to violence and just horrifyingly graphic actions. The way it's done in the game is kind of funny because it's essentially that friend you have in D&D who gives like the most insane and violent answers in terms of actions to every single situation, but like actually materialized in-game, which is a bit funny to me. But the reason why Dark Urge is so violent is because he is a ball spawn, which is a mortal who has a fragment of the essence of the god of murder, Ball. This is all you need to know for now, as I'll come back to this later in the Dead 3 portion. A quick thing of note, just like Shadowheart being shortened to Shart, the Dark Urge is shortened to Dirge within the community, so when I say Dirge in this video, I mean the Dark Urge. The Githzerai Brain. The Githyanki play a very important role within the plot of Baldur's Gate 3, but for the people who are interested in D&D lore, you'll know that there's two factions of the main Gith race, the Githyanki and the Gith Zerai. I won't get too much into the Githyanki lore for now, but essentially speaking, after freeing themselves from the Mind Flayer Empire, the Githyanki wanted to go on and conquer all planes, whereas the Gith Zerai wanted to be more isolationist and kind of work on themselves now that they have this newfound freedom. Throughout the game, we don't meet a Gith Zerai in person, but we do find a Gith Zerai brain that we can actually talk to within the end of Act 2. You find it in the Necrotic Library, and doing so gives you a permanent buff for the entirety of the game, so I highly recommend that you do it. I know that it's essentially just a cameo, but I absolutely love that Larian included it into the game, because as expansive as Baldur's Gate 3 is, it's still a small part of this insanely huge D&D lore. The Salunite Resistance. This one is a hidden quest with an Act 2 that is there to give you a lot of context as to what happened in the area. You pick up a note from the body of a Sharon Inquisitor and go on chasing tales around the map until you get to a Mason's Guild. There, you find a logbook that gives you context of what happened in the area. The TLDR of this is that Ketherg Thorm and his whole family were once Selunite followers. They then turned to Shar and went on active war against all Selunite worshippers in the area trying to wipe them out. At some point, they got into conflict with Jahira and her Harpers. 
This information is only a singular puzzle piece though, which fits into a much bigger picture that we'll get into later on in the video. The bear scene. This one is pretty well known both from within and outside of the community, but it is a scene where your character romances a bear. Now, it isn't actually a bear, mind you. It is Halson, who's shapeshifted into a bear, but I, I don't know why I said that. Like, it makes the situation any better. <laughs> You're still f***ing a bear. <laughs> now, despite it being awkward and all, it is a crazy marketing tactic because it's how I found out about the game to begin with. If it wasn't for this cutscene, I would have never played Baldur's Gate 3, so I guess I'm grateful that you're able to romance a bear, which is honestly a sentence that I never thought I'd say in my life. Level 4, The Balding Thrall. Shadowheart is a Salunite. Now this is revealed pretty late into Act 2, but despite this, I'm gonna go through it in only Layer 4 because Shadowheart is a very central companion. Shadowheart makes it abundantly clear earlier on that she's a follower of Shar, but she didn't start out this way. In Act 2, we learn that she started out as a Salunite when she was a child. To give you some context as to the two different gods, Saloon and Shar are two equal but opposite sister goddesses. Saloon is the goddess of a bunch of good stuff like the moon, love, marriage, and I'm pretty sure she's the one who created, like, the sun, I think? <laughs> but I'm not so sure about that part. Shar, on the other hand, is the goddess of a bunch of bad stuff like loss, grieving, and just darkness. Not the darkness of like shadows when there's no light, but more so the darkness that is within the hearts of mortals. This is where Shadowheart comes in. Her actual name is Genevieve Hallowleaf, and she was a Salunite as a child, just like her parents. A rite of passage for Salunite followers is to be left out in the woods and for them to find their own way back home alone. Shar instructed Vicornia de Vere, the mother superior of a Shar temple, to capture Shadowheart and bring her into the temple. Now, Shadowheart's father found out about this, but he couldn't stop them even in his wolf form as we saw in the cutscene. After this point, Shadowheart was raised as a Sharon, with her memories being changed and deleted depending on what Shar needed. We learn this at the apex of Shadowheart's character arc, where we either let her kill the Night Song or spare her in the Shadowfell. We learn the rest of the story, where we get to Act 3 and reach the House of Grief. As a quick summary, Shar was essentially flexing on Saloon because she wanted Vicunia Devir to capture and raise Shadowheart as a Sharon, and eventually have her replace Viconia as the mother superior of a temple. So Shadowheart's entire life is the biggest middle finger from goddess to goddess, which whether that works or not is up to you. Isabel is the daughter of General Kethric Thorm. Now this isn't a secret, the game just shares up tells you it at the end of the act, but what I'm gonna go into in this section is the entire lore of what happened in the Shadowlands with the curse and stuff. All this is quite easily missable as the lore isn't really given to you in one big dump, but rather is scattered out throughout the entire area in hidden quests like the Salunite residence I just talked about. So, the Thorn family lived happily ever after as Saloon followers within the Moonrise Towers. This didn't last long though because Isabel's mother died, with her following not so long after. General Kethric Thorm was full of grief, which is the point where he turned from Saloon to Shar, eventually becoming Shar's chosen. He raised an army of Dark Justiciers, an elite Sharon soldier, to go to war against Salunai followers in the area. He battled with the Druids from the Druid Grove and Harpers, with them also being the one responsible for the Shadow Curse in the area. More than a hundred years later, Kethric locked himself into the Thorm family mausoleum, where Michael made him an offer. The offer was that he would bring Isabel back to life in exchange for Kethric's body and soul and devotion to Michael. Kethric Thorm loved his daughter, so he obviously made the sacrifice and brought Isabel back to life. Now, Isabel, upon seeing this, didn't exactly run back to her father with open arms, but instead ran away from him, with her opening a safe area within the Last Light Inn. She allied with Jahira and the Harpers to fight against the Absolute, which is the point that our character party arrives into Act 2. Hey guys, it's me Roku, I've made a mistake in the video right here because the name of the god is Miracle, not Mikril. Fortunately, I have pronounced it correctly later on, so please forgive me. The Iron Throne. The Iron Throne is a very important part of the game if you're going for a good playthrough, but unfortunately, it is also very, very missable. It is essentially an underwater prison in Act 3 that Enver Gortash uses to keep his most valuable prisoners. Firstly, he holds Duke Ravengard, who's already a very important person, as we discussed earlier on. Secondly, he holds the families of all the Gondians he needs to maintain his Steel Watch. 
Lastly, which is an optional prisoner, he holds Amelum, the chillest mind flayer this side of the Mississippi. To have Amelum appear in the Iron Throne, you have to 1. Meet him in the Underdark, and 2. Make sure that Lady Esther does not get the Githyanki or the Albear Egg. Then, he'll be in this chair down in the bottom left corner of the map where you can find him in the Iron Throne. Cut crafting system. The game at the moment has a pretty fleshed out alchemy system for you to make potions, elixirs, and etc. In development, however, it also used to have a crafting system where you can make weapons and pieces of armor. Now, the system itself is removed from the game, but what remains are remnants of it, like pieces of materials like copper and iron scattered throughout the game, or the gems and things like rope being all over the place. These used to have a purpose, but now they're just there for you to sell to shopkeepers. Kaga betrayed the Druid Grove. This one is an entirely missable quest that you start by going into Kaga's room and opening her chest to read a note. The note leads you down a rabbit hole where you eventually find out that Kaga allied herself with the Shadow Druids to take over the Grove. This is entirely missable, and honestly not even that necessary because once you free Chatson, he kinda just returns and sorts her out regardless of whether you found out about her betrayal or not. Layer 5 Hungry for Brains The Vlacketh Wish Ending This is an absolutely hilarious way that you can get your entire party killed by just being kind of dumb. <laughs> but basically speaking, when you go to the Githyanki Kresh, you get the opportunity to talk to Vlacketh, which is the queen of all Githyanki. Now, when talking to her, if you go out of your way to be just completely disrespectful and go so far as to dare her to kill you herself, she does just that. She casts a wish spell and your entire party dies on the spot. It is the single most F around and find out moment in the entire game, and it is also one of the few instances where we see a level 9 spell being cast. There will be more information on spells and how they scale with levels in the lore of D&D later on in the video. The Blood of Lathander The Blood of Lathander is the best cleric mace in the entire game, so let's do a quick rundown of its lore, shall we? The weapon is found within the Rosimore Monastery in the Mount of Pass of Act 1. Now this monastery is built in the honor of Lathander. Lathander is one the best gods in the pantheon of D&D because he's the god of things like youth, birth, athleticism, self-improvement, perfection, vitality, creativity, just an entire portfolio of awesome positive things. To summarize the story behind the mace, a bunch of Lethendarian followers were stuck in a battle against a very powerful wizard. They prayed to Lethander to help them in order to defeat this guy and he did just that. Lathander sent down one of his avatars to defeat this wizard and did so successfully. Despite this, the avatar sustained a very bad wound which bled four drops of blood. This blood seeped into the ground with a wizard retrieving it and encasing it with an amber. This amber containing the four blood was then used to create the mace, hence the mace being named the Blood of Lathander. The mace remained within the open hand chapel of Lathander until it was stolen by a bunch of Shar followers because if anything in the D&D world smells like feces, Shar probably had some role to play in it. Fortunately for everyone, the mace was retrieved and then placed within the Rosimor Monastery, where it remained until the Githyanki attacked. The Githyanki, looking to open a crèche around the area, attacked and just completely destroyed the Rosimor Monastery. Although the monks were defeated, they successfully sealed away the blood of Lathander deep within the monastery, and to get it without destroying the entire thing, you have to solve a puzzle on the higher floors. In one of my anti-Githyanki playthroughs, although I finished the puzzle, I on purpose didn't put in the crest and just took the mace so that the entire monastery would collapse on top of the Githyanki crash. Removed Origin Narration As you know, a lot of the times in the game, a narrator will describe what's in front of you in a third-person voice, like, let's say there's a Mind Flayer on the ground, she'll go like, the, the Mind Flayer is making you feel hunger or something like that right in a previous version of the game if you picked an origin character instead of making your own character instead of that third person narration you get a first person narration in the voice of the character you picked so if you picked a starian for example he'd be like that mind flare is making me feel hunger or something like that right now this isn't just some idea on a sticky note somewhere this is an actually fully fledged developed part of the game if you look it up on youtube and i'll actually link some of these videos down in the description you can find entire hour-long videos, which is just a compilation of this self-narration. Quill Groot Slang While playing as a Dark Urge, after you defeat the goblins at the gate of the Druid Grove, you'll have the tiefling bard Alfira come up to your camp at night and join your party. Her membership 
of your gang doesn't really last that long though because this is where the game decides to show you what you are as a Dark Urge character. You wake up in the middle of the night and find out that your character has, in their sleep, violently butchered and killed Elfira. It's honestly that whole it just got real moment as a Dark Urge because you essentially killed someone who's just like a sweet innocent character who actually looked up to you and was ready to just like devote herself to your cause. Now there is a way to actually save her as the Dark Urge but you unfortunately have to kill someone else during that night and that someone else is Quail Grootslang. If you go find Elfira in the Druid Grove before the night she joins your party and then knock her out, instead of her, Quill will join your party. As a quick TLDR over her lore, she is a Thymeri dragon, and a Thymeri sort of tradition is to have arranged marriages. She didn't really like this, so she basically just went off on her own, fleed from her home, and is just traveling throughout the Sword Coast. Now, Quill has no martial or self-defense abilities of her own. She is like a bard who cannot defend herself, so the night she shows up to her camp, she is basically just robbed of everything she has, aside from just, like, her shirt, essentially. The whole conversation with her before you kill her is actually one of the more more pure and innocent ones in the entire game, but it is quite unfortunate that to save Alfira, someone else has got to go. Gale blows up the absolute ending. This one is a premature ending of the game that you can get with an act two, but essentially speaking, when you first enter the Shadow Cursed area through the Mountain Pass or the Underdark, you meet the wizard Elminster. Elminster is the sort of Merlin-y type character that is sent by Mistra to deliver a message to Gale. And that message is, when you meet the absolute, use the Nethery's orb to blow it up. Once you get to the end of Act 2, where you're essentially face to face with Gortash, Orin, and Ketherick, the Chosen of the Dead 3, Gale offers to straight up just blow himself up, killing everyone in the area. If you let him go through with it, he does that and kills everyone. Now, although this does destroy the whole absolute plot, all the Mind Flayers, Tadpoles, and other illithid creatures in the area are still gonna remain there, so what you've essentially done is allow them to go across the Sword Coast and kill a lot of people. Layer 6. Mind Flayer. The Mirror of Loss. The Mirror of Loss is a great way to get a plus two of any attribute they want in the game, but it is unfortunately very missable because it's kind of tucked away at the very corner of the room that you gotta be in. Once you reach Act 3 and get into the House of Grief where you can kind of finish Shadowheart's whole plot, you can find the mirror at the back of the room that Shadowheart's parents are kept in. Now game mechanic wise, when you walk up to the mirror, you can essentially offer it one of your memories, which is just a minus two in any skill of your choice and gain a plus two in another skill. So if you're going for a martial character, you can go for a minus two intelligence and get a plus two in strength. This plus two exceeds the 20 limit, so it's an amazing thing for late game builds. And also the minus two isn't really permanent because it's a curse on your character, and you can very easily remove curses with Shadowheart. Lore wise, this is the main way that Shar followers essentially remove the memories of other Shar followers to fit the needs of Shar herself. This specific mirror in the room is where Shadowheart was made to lose most of her memories of her life. The Tiefling Refugees. At the beginning of the game in Act 1, you come across a bunch of tiefling refugees. It isn't really made 100% clear as to why they had to flee in the first place. The context behind why they're now on the run is explained in a prequel D&D campaign called Descent into Avernus. The tieflings primarily come from a city named Elturel, and before the events of the game within that D&D campaign, the city was transported into Avernus, which is like the D&D version of Hell. The specific reason as to why this happened is a bit too out of scope for this video, but the tiefling population was essentially blamed both within Elturel and cities around Elturel because tieflings are descendants of creatures from Hell, and thus the tieflings in the area were falsely blamed and forced out of their homes. With them now being on the run to reach Gate to seek asylum. The Necromancy of Thay. Within the Blighted Village in Act 1, if you explore all the basement areas, you'll find a book with a creepy face on it named the Necromancy of Thay. This is the prized possession of a red wizard named Ilan Toth. Now there really isn't too much lore to the book itself, I looked through it, trust me, couldn't find any, but if you read the book, and pass all three saving checks, you gain one plus in wisdom and one plus bonus to wisdom saving throws and ability checks. The book comes into play again in Act 3, where you have to find the Tharkite Codex from the Sorcerer's Sundries. Picking up the book and reading it gives your character a curse. Now, if you cure that curse with Shadowheart, that character will now receive 20 temporary health every single time they do a long rest. On top of this, 
If you go back and read the Necromancy of Thea again, you gain the ability of Dance Macabre. This ability lets you summon 4 ghouls, which is insanely useful in some of those fights where the enemy just has way too many units. Pretty snazzy stuff, huh? Cut Tadpole Consequences While playing the game, you come across a lot of Mind Flare Tadpole specimens, which your Dream Visitor, or the Emperor, recommends that you absorb the power of. Now logically, you would think that your run would change at least a little bit depending on whether you use the Tadpoles or not. But this is not really the case at all. Essentially speaking, as long as you don't consume the main special tactile to turn into a Mind Flare, there are zero consequences for absorbing the other Mind Flare specimen throughout the game. As far as I can tell, only two things change. Number one, there are some dark sort of veins on your character's face, and number two, when the Emperor offers to change you into an Illithid, instead of just saying no, you have to pass a Wisdom saving throw. There actually was meant to be severe consequences to using too many tadpoles in the previous versions of the game, but this was unfortunately removed. I personally don't like this that much because in my first playthrough, I went out of my way to not consume any of the specimen or even use any of my illithid powers. Safe to say, I was a little disappointed when I found out that it didn't really change anything. Cut epilogues. Now this, in my opinion, is the worst thing that was cut from the game, not in the terms of like, it was bad content that was cut out, but more so it was really bad that it was cut out. You ever wonder why the game ends so abruptly? Like you're on this 100 hour adventure, making so many decisions, and everything just ends like that. Larian had actually planned for there to be an epilogue sequence, where a summary of your story would actually play out at the end of it. According to some tweets, there were up to 17,000 variations of what could play at the end of your adventure. Now this number alone is actually pretty insane, so it's understandable why they couldn't finish it, but I really hope that in the future version of the game, they do add it back on, because it's just a very integral part, I think, to have a nice little bow tie ending on your story. Like, I want to know what happened at the Grove, I want to know what happened in the active Shadowlands after I left it, you know what I'm saying? Layer 7 Omelum, the Dead Three. The three main villains of the game, Kethrig, Gortash, and Orin, are the chosen of three different quasi deities Miracle, Bane, and Baal, respectively. These three gods, together, are referred to as the Dead Three, and their portfolio is three different aspects of death. For reference, a quasi-deity is essentially the lowest rank that a god can be in the world of D&D. The specific reasons as to why they're quasi-deities is something I'll get into later, but for now, these three used to be mortals. Ketherick is the first main boss that you meet in the game, and he's the chosen of Miracle. Miracle is the god of decay and exhaustion, and we actually do meet him as a part of the Ketherick boss battle. Gortash, the second possible boss that you can encounter, is the chosen of the god Bane. Bane is the god of terror, oppression, and tyranny. He doesn't appear like Miracle in a sort of avatar form, but you do get to talk to him if you can't speak with the dead on Gortash's corpse. The last boss, Orin, is the Chosen of Baal, the Lord of Murder. Now, Baal is the god out of the three that we learned the most about, because not only do we explore an entire temple of Baal, but there's an entire origin background story, the Dark Urge, that has Baal written all over it. There is a lot more interesting stuff about the gods that we can talk about, but that would more so fall under the scope of D&D lore rather than Baldur's Gate 3 lore. Let me know in the comments below which of the three was your favorite boss battle. Personally, I loved Orin the most, because when you play as the Dark Urge, the one you want to get against her is like a legendary battle moment. It's just so epic, it's unbelievable. The fight against her, in my opinion, is rivaled only by the House of Hope, and also fighting Anser in the Worms Rock. The Dark Urge and Gortash. Let's get into the backstory of the Dark Urge. Before I get into it, there is one thing that's kind of weird that I have to explain to get out of the way. The Dark Urge isn't just a customizable self-insert character, but more so an origin character. This means that they actually had a role to play within the plot of the game. He is a male white dragonborn sorcerer who had an immensely important part to play in the entire story of the game. The part that doesn't make sense is that despite him being so important to the story of the game, if you don't have him as a character that you start out with in the Nautiloid, then there's basically no sign of him ever being alive, despite how important he is to the plot of the game. A plot that we're going to get into right now. The Cliff Notes version of this is the Dark Urge is the guy who is essentially responsible for the entire plot of the Absolute. He is the guy along with Gortash who came up with the whole idea of taking over with the Elder Brain. 
they first off stole the crown of Carses from the vault of Mephistopheles, who is second to Asmodeus, which is the king of hell itself. They then acquired a document called the Accelerated Grand Design, and then you can basically just put the rest together yourself. They wanted Ketherick to build an army and invade Baldur's Gate as a city so they could use the Elder Brain to take it under control. The Dark Urge and Gortash actually had a pretty good relationship amongst each other. Now they weren't besties, but it was more so a relationship of massive mutual respect. This is very much apparent when you first meet Gortash face to face in Act 3. But what caused the Dark Urge to disappear? The Dark Urge versus Orin. This is revealed towards the end of your character arc as the Dark Urge. Unlike the other Origin characters, you were not infected on the Nautiloid ship. The Dark Urge was instead infected by Orin in Moonrise Towers. Dirge was not really like the other ball spawn in that he wasn't just born to a mortal lady, he was essentially made for the divine essence and blood of Ball himself. He was the favorite child of the God of Death, which rubbed Orin the wrong way. Now Orin, who didn't want to be the subordinate of the Dark Urge anymore, ambushed him and attacked him in Moonrise Towers. She cracked his skull open, which led to him losing most of his memories, and also infected him with a tadpole to control him. And thus, she had successfully usurped the Dark Urge, taking control of the Temple of Baal. For now. Baal. This one is an entirely missable part of the game that you can find in that caverny area that leads to the Arcane Tower in the Underdark in Act 1. In the corner of that area, you find a climb down to an underground cavern that has a tribe of Quota worshipping a version of Baal. But upon further investigation, the creature that they're worshipping isn't actually Baal, but a red cat pretending to be Baal. The thing with the Quota is that they literally have the power to manifest their gods throughout belief. So because they worshipped this red cap as Ball, the red cap gained insane amounts of power and actually became really strong. It's like a whole chicken or the egg kind of situation, but I guess the red cap just kind of lucked out and passed a few speed checks. Now, although you can get through this area like usual, you know, chop, 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 kill, 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 save everyone, <laughs> there is an opportunity for you to sacrifice one of your companions for a permanent buff called Ball's Blessing. Ball's Blessing gives you an advantage on all bleeding targets, so if you're going for a barbarian, or a bleed style build it is a very good permanent buff. In my personal opinion, the buff isn't really strong enough to sacrifice an entire companion, but if you are doing an evil playthrough where you're going to wipe out the grove, you might as well just sacrifice Will or Karlak because they're going to leave your party anyway. The Emperor is Balduran. Now we all know that the Emperor is an illithid mind flare, but who exactly was he before he underwent Ceremorphosis? Now if you've watched the video up until this point, I'll assume that you're literate and just say that he is Balduran, or at least he used to be. For those of you who don't know, Baldran is a legendary adventurer who founded the city of Baldur's Gate. You can find this out for yourself in an entire huge lore dump by dealing with Anser in the Wyrm's Rock basement area. When I found out about it at the time, it was such a huge shock to me because it's an insanely huge revelation and the Emperor just stands there like it's no big deal like yep. I am Baldran, like bro, are you serious? Come on! Now we're gonna go too deep into this point because I already made a very in-depth video on the Emperor, his morality, and his backstory. If you wanna go check that video out, it'll be in the cards and also in the description. Level 8. The Emperor. Elminster. As we discussed previously, once you reach Act 2, there is an old man wizard called Elminster who will 1. deliver a message from Mr. to Gale, and 2. unlock the Nethery's orb within his chest. What Elminster does with that whole spell is make it so that the Nethery's orb within Gale's chest is less a random nuke that can go off at any moment, but is more so a controlled explosion that Gale can set off at will. Now we've already discussed what happens when you do this, but this section is more so about Elminster himself. Although Gale just outright tells you how big of a deal Elminster is, I don't think he does him justice. This isn't because Gale failed in his explanation, but more so because Elminster is such a huge deal within the world of D&D. To put it simply, Elminster is one of the oldest and most powerful wizards in all of the D&D world. He is the favorite chosen of Mistra, the goddess of all magic. Magic, and he's featured in lots of games, books, comic books, and novels where he is the main character. This guy has had tons of adventures, with him fighting and beating literal gods. Getting to meet him in game is honestly so fun for a fan of the D&D lore, but do we actually get to meet him in person? 
Food for thought until the next layer, huh? Gale is insanely powerful. At the beginning of the game, all of our characters, including the player character themselves, are infected by a tadpole which severely weakens them. This explains why in terms of game mechanics, everyone starts out as a level 1 goober. However, the characters and companions that end up joining our party do have entire backstories of their own with their own feats and specific levels of power before the events of the game. What I'm going to do right now is go through all the Act 1 initial companions and list them from least to most powerful. Starting off at the bottom of our list, we have Lazelle. Now, Githyanki Uprising is insanely difficult, so she has to be a strong person for surviving that, but she's essentially just a default grunt of the Githyanki, which isn't really all that special. Up next, we have Asterion. Now, Asterion is a vampire spawn, which is powerful compared to a normal human, and keep in mind that he is severely weakened because he was starved for 200 years, but compared to the more powerful characters, he kind of just gets blown out of the water. The middle of the pack is Shadowheart, who was the designated healer of an elite Sharon squad, sent to retrieve the Astro Prism. She wouldn't be sent on this mission if she was just a regular degular cleric now, would she? Third place and arguably tied for second is Karlak, who as we all know, fought in the hells of Avernus. She was the right hand of Zariel and was an absolute monster back in hell in the Blood War. Second place tied with Karlak, we have Will, who I honestly don't even need to get into him being strong because he honestly won't shut up about it. And then, between number two and number one, we have an insanely large gap because Gale is so much more powerful than literally everyone else. The reason why Gale is in line with the rest of the companions in the game is because not only is he weakened by the tadpole, he's also weakened by the Nethery's orb, which is actively draining all his powers. The most we get access to for our characters is a level 6 spell. The power scaling of spells in the world of D&D by level isn't linear, but more so exponential. Spells get way more powerful the higher level they are. If we disregard Elminster treating him like a colleague, which he wouldn't do so to a weak wizard, Gale is one of the only characters in the game with access to a level 9 spell. Now that isn't to say that Gale is more powerful than someone like Elminster, not even close, but he is strong enough to solo our entire party if it wasn't for the tadpole and the Nethery's orb. Now this list is quite rudimentary because if we included every single companion, it would shake things up quite a bit. The Dark Urge, for example, is an insanely powerful sorcerer who would give Gale a good run for his money. Early Access Karlak. Anyone remember Karlak from the Early Access version of the game? No? Well, here she is. Yes, the tall, muscle-bound, strong, barbarian Karlak is a relatively recent addition to the game companion-wise. Although her story outline and her character backstory of being from Hell hasn't really changed all that much, they did redo her entire personality, physical appearance, and also her voice. I had played through Act 1 in the early access version of the game, so when I first started the game, when it was officially released, it was an absolute shocker as to how much Karlak had changed. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to do a Karlak romance all over again to recoup my energy here. Stick close to Mama Kay. Don't mind if I do. Raphael could save you. In the current version of the game, despite offering to do so, Raphael doesn't actually cure you of your tadpoles. What he does do instead is give you the Orphic Hammer to free Orpheus in exchange for the Crown of Carsis. He's essentially just all talk, but you have to free yourself at the end of the day anyway. However, in a previous version of the game, it was planned for Raphael to be a perfectly viable way for you to remove your tadpoles. In fact, Raphael was planned to be a very powerful merchant, with you being able to buy all those House of Hope artifacts from him in exchange for soul coins. This, alongside many things, were removed from the game. Withers is Jurgle. If you play as a paladin and pass a 20 dice roll check upon talking to Withers for the first time, you detect that he has godlike energy within him. Withers' connection to a god is all but confirmed at the end of the game in that whole epilogue scene where he's talking smack to the dead three. This is because Withers is Jurgle himself. Jurgle used to be a greater deity of Faerun, with him being the god of death murder, and strife. At some point though, he kind of just got bored with being a god, so he divided up his powers among the dead three. This honestly is a very smart way of including game mechanics such as revival or respecting your character, because Jurgle literally used to be the god of death. It's nice because it stays consistent within the lore of D&D. The Elder Brain. Prequel Browser Game. 
Larian has made a game that you can play in your browser right now that is pretty fun called Blood in Baldur's Gate. It acts as a prequel of sorts to the game and goes through a series of murders with you acting as an investigator called Tav looking through all of it as like a detective. It also includes lore about the Dark Urge, so if you want to find out more about our murder happy little lizard, go check out the game in the description below. Cut Upper City this is one of the biggest pieces of content cut from the game, but upon reaching the lower city of Baldur's Gate, you are initially able to enter the upper city. Not only was the upper city planned to be an entire area of its own, with it having buckets and tons of content for you to explore, it also had continuations of many of the storylines from lower city. Kazador, for example, was supposed to play a massive role in the upper city in terms of politics and could actually be an ally for you to summon in the fight against the Elder Brain. So if some of the storylines within the lower city feel like they were cut off abruptly, this is why. They were originally intended to continue into the upper city. Elminster isn't really here. I kind of hinted at this the last time we talked about Elminster, but the version of him that we see in the game and in our camp isn't actually Elminster. It is a simulacrum. A simulacrum in D&D is essentially an illusionary copy of another being. In this case, Elminster himself, which he sent to us to act as an extension of his will. This explains why you can find him at multiple points on the map simultaneously. The way we find out for sure whether he's a simulacrum or not is by attacking him and killing him because once you do succeed, his body turns into ice and then disintegrates. I absolutely love this, because this makes sense as to how we were able to kill Elminster in the game. It's not Elminster, it's just his copy, because if it was actual Elminster from the lore, he would kill literally everyone in the party like that. Mistra likes Mind Flayers. This one is kind of funny, but if you choose Gale and play as him as your origin character throughout the entire game, you get to the Crown of Carsus and have to decide what to do with it. On the one hand, you can use the Crown of Carsus to ascend to Godhood and challenge Mistra. This will end up in Mistra, overpowering and completely schooling Gale, destroying him forever. On the other hand, you can use the Crown to repair the damage to the weave that Gale had done. After doing so, you can ask to be forgiven and taken back by Mistra, which will honestly give you a pretty funny answer depending on whether you're a Mind Flayer or not. Now if you're Gale in his human form, Mistra will just deny you and return you to the world of mortals. But if you took the special tadpole and turned into a Mind Flayer, Mistra will actually accept you and welcome you into her godlike sort of realm. It is honestly hilarious to think that Mistra might have a thing for Mind Flayers, but this also might have to do with the fact that Mind Flayers have no souls. <laughs> Orpheus is evil. If you were to go off all the information from within the game, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Orpheus is a good guy. I mean, the Githyanki are being oppressed by Vlakith, held down, forced to be evil, whereas Orpheus is a prince who wants to liberate his people and set them free. While all of this is true, and Orpheus is a relatively noble character, what isn't really widely known is what Orpheus plans to do after liberating his people from Vlakith. To give some context, the Githyanki used to be the primary slave race of the Mind Flayer in their Mind Flare empire from all those years back. They eventually broke free from their control and wanted to destroy every single Mind Flare out there. The main leader of the rebellion was called Gith, the mother of all Githyanki. Orpheus from the Astral Prism is a direct descendant of Gith herself. Once the Githyanki broke free, the primary vision of Gith was for the Githyanki to 1. wipe out all Mind Flares and 2 conquer every single other plane of existence. This wasn't really some idea in the back of her head, this was something that she straight up said, with almost everyone in the Githyanki Council aside from Xerthimon agreeing to her. Given the extremist and xenophobic nature of the Githyanki, their conquest would involve lots of killing, genociding, and enslavement. Just to make it clear, this isn't really me making stuff up or extrapolating from information, but it is literal Githyanki lore. You can read it for yourself if you open up the D&D lore wikis. The idea of conquering all the other planes is one of the main legacies that Gith left behind. And Orpheus kind of follows her mother's ideologies like a religion. He's a zealous follower of his mother's beliefs, which means that if you freed Orpheus and he was allowed to liberate his people, he would eventually wage that conquering war against everyone. 
Because of this, the worst possible thing you can do in game for the world of D&D is free Orpheus and have him survive the ordeal with a netherbrain, because if he does, you might be indirectly responsible for countless deaths. Karlak speaks to the player. A few months ago, a video surfaced on the internet that depicted Karlak talking directly to the player. And no, I don't mean your player character, but you, the person playing the Baldur's Gate game. The video, uploaded by Chublot, which I'll leave in the description, shows Karlak using a technique that allows for her to look into your eyes and tell if you're lying or not. After you agree to go along with it, for the first time in the game, ever, from any character, Karlak looks directly at the camera at you. Where it kinda gets creepy is, this isn't really just an easter eggy fourth wall break, but Karlak goes through stages of realizing she's inside a video game. She makes comments on how none of this is real, it's all a web of code, and how she's stuck in the game with her being forced to relive the game over and over again. It's honestly a pretty horrifying existence, being stuck in a game as a plaything of some guy who has absolute power over you who doesn't exactly care about you at all, man, just... Uh. The last question she asks you is whether you're having fun with the game or not, after which you answer it, and she returns to her goofy self. Now, personally, I think this is just a fan-made video of like a fake cutscene from the game due to three primary reasons. Reason number one, there is no other first-person account of this happening aside from this one video in the entirety of the internet. There is no Reddit post. There is no Twitter screenshot. There is no other YouTube video. Just this one video. And this scene isn't like, oh, Karlak bugged out and farted like some, you know, although that would get uploaded, but it isn't something to be ignored and put away instantly. It's a very unique moment that is rare to experience, so anybody who'd see it would instantly tell others about it, wouldn't they? So this one video, being the only first-person account of this happening, is very suspicious in my opinion. Number two, the voice actors of the companions in Baldur's Gate 3 are very much embedded within the community. So if someone asked the voice actor of Karlak to make this video for them, they would honestly just agree for the fun of it. The last reason is a bit of a subjective or a personal one, but there's a certain consistency of how things are, and you get an eye for it the more you play the game. You know, the way they move their hands, the way their lips move, the way the lighting of the game works, and the footage of Karlak talking in that video looks more like a blender animation rather than a cutscene from the game itself. Despite this though, it is a pretty fun scene to watch on YouTube, so I heavily recommend that you go check it out. Karlak could be cured. This one is a bit of a sad one, but the reason as to why we can't cure Karlak's infernal heart is because that was supposed to happen within the upper city. And as mentioned before, the upper city was cut from the game. In the original version of the game, it was fully possible for us to fix her and have her live on in our world happily ever after, but unfortunately, we don't get that. The version of the Karlak ending that we have right now was the planned fail state of her quests from the previous versions in that if you ignored Karlak completely and did not do her quest, this is what was planned to happen. This is honestly the worst thing to be cut from the game in my opinion, because she's like the one character who doesn't get a good ending. I get the whole, oh not everything can have a good ending and stuff, but come on Larian, please just this one time, please add it to the game. Anyway. Daisy. The people who played the early access version of the game will recognize Daisy's disappearance, but essentially speaking, Daisy was the previous name for the Dream Guardian character that you make in your character customization menu. Now at the moment, the Dream Guardian is essentially an illusionary form of the Emperor that he uses to communicate with you at the beginning of the game. This was not the case before though. Before, the Dream Guardian was to be the representation of the tadpole in your head. This makes perfect sense because the tadpole in your head picks biologically the most attractive possible being to you and uses that to manipulate you. Daisy would essentially try her best to seduce your character into giving in to the tadpole and turning into a mind flare. While your body would turn into a mind flare and join the absolute, your mind would live happily ever after with your dream guardian by the river at the beginning of the game. There actually used to be a planned daisy ending where a character would just give their body up and become a mind flare. She would likely also play a huge part in the whole tadpole consequences that was cut from the game. Daisy used to be such a big part of the game that two of the songs, The Power and 
by the river were essentially just completely based on her. Honestly, I don't mind them replacing Daisy with the Emperor because this way, the illusionary form adds more depth to the Emperor's character. Minthara Pregnancy Minthara was a relatively recent addition to the game in terms of her companionship, so there was a ton of content that was cut from the game that had to do with her character. She originally had a much deeper story, including a pregnancy. You heard that correctly. Your player character, if you romance Minthara, could have a child with her and have everybody in the camp react to her having a child. I will be leaving a link to a bunch of data mined voice lines of the other companions reacting to this. Listen to them and figure out how you yourself feel about this fact. All right, that is pretty much it for this video. It honestly took me a very long time to put this one together because not only did I have to make this video itself, but I also had to make the iceberg from ground up with me doing all the research you needed to put it together. I put a lot of work into this so I really hope that you guys appreciate it because it was low-key fun for me to make as well. With all that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.